We're back talking about tendons today. Believe it or not, this is a tendon. So if you get right in there, that's what a tendon kind of looks like. Or this is just a wiggly thera stick thing. Uh, so in our last video, we talked about how to differentiate between uh, the umbrella of tendinopathy, tendinitis, tendinosis, and all those other kind of subcategories. Today, I wanted to go over, okay, let's say we figure out what is going on. Right, I got the itis, I got the osis, and now I need a strategy for those. So the most typical strategy for some sort of tendon injury, so long as we don't have an acute rupture or a, a really progressed uh, sprain, is gonna be some sort of isometric loading. There's been all sorts of research done on isometric loading and the correct time frames that we should be using, the amounts of time, uh, both uh, per set, per rep, and then aggregates overall. So let's go over that real fast. So what we wanna see per kind of rep or set, well, it's kind of one of the same because it's kind of a one rep uh, scheme right now, is about a 45 second duration hold. Now let's say we're working on something like a patellar tendon. Creating an isometric load on the patellar tendon can occur a lot of different ways. Uh, something like a wall sit could occur, something like a split squat hold. The thing we need to talk about with tendons is not creating a uh, area of compression. So think about your Achilles tendon wrapping around the back of your heel. So if that tendon comes around and my heel is right here, you can imagine how that compression can occur right there. So I don't want to create an isometric hold in a deep stretch of dorsiflexion in that case because that's going to create compression and compression is notorious for creating hypoxia, which then can lead to more of that itis and then to that osis or that cellular death. So in a patellar tendon scenario, we don't wanna go into deep knee flexion. We wanna create, uh, usually if we just search for a non-painful position where we can create our isometric load. So sometimes we're in something like a wall squat or a split squat, we have to come out of that a little bit to offload the compression that would create or be created around the tibial tuberosity uh, or over top of, or underneath the patella, things like that. So. Isometric load, 45 seconds. That 45 seconds is the magical number that's been able to show that we create the stem cell response we're looking for. You also create some analgesia. So if we're in a correct position, we're really treating what we think we're treating, we should actually see pain relief occur to a certain extent as we go through these sets and reps. The total aggregate time is about two minutes worth of total work. Maybe a little more, not really less. So what we tell most people is four to five rounds of 45 second holds to get around two minutes. We're doing that maybe a couple times a day, two, three times a day. So that's our acute first stage of loading is isometric. Uh, timelines are hard here. So we can't say, hey, two weeks in, you go after the next phase. This is where uh, bioindividuality comes in and make sure we're always going through a proper, proper clinical assessment and audit uh, strategy but isotonic, so isometric is a static position. Isotonic is the same rate through a position. So it's the same speed through a movement. So this to me is if we were doing like a tempo of a squat, so it's five seconds down, but that also means it's five seconds up. Things like that, and then we could get into the debate of are we literally, are we really loading the eccentric component? Doesn't matter, we're looking at isotonic because now we're looking at putting the same uh, stress strain across that tendon through the duration. Time frame for this is still two minutes total. So however many sets reps that gets us, usually we're looking at somewhere at 15 reps, lighter weight up front, and then we go down into like the four to six rep range, very heavy load, especially as we're getting ready for this next uh, uh, part of rehab or phase of rehab, which is energy return. So we would tend to think of this as ballistic or where we start to get into explosive movements. When we look at things like uh, running, Energy return is huge, and energy return is gonna be wildly affected by our biomechanics. So let's, look at, let's back up for a second and look at the goals of these strategies. So the goal of these first two phases, isometric and isotonic, is really twofold. Reduce sensitivity. So a, a movement, a tissue, a neurologic structure can become sensitized because we do too much too soon, too much too often, or I have poor biomechanics. So reduce sensitivity, at the same time, we increase capacity. So we have to talk real quick when we're talking about increased capacity. How do you actually, I'm gonna flip back around, I feel like Vanna White here. Uh, how do you actually increase capacity in a tendon? Well, remember we looked down the barrel of a tendon. So we have all these little fibrils and then we have this big peritinon and then we have this tendon. 
So if you look at an injury of a tendon, so say these, these circles in the middle right here, these green circles are damaged tissue, the blue are normal, the black are extra uh, bundles of fibers of tendon that have been laid down around there. So the interesting thing about a tendon when it heals is it doesn't heal the part that was injured. It just gets thicker. It lays down more tendinous uh, tissue and that's why we have to dictate with isometrics and isotonics what kind of fibers we want to be laying down there uh, since that stem cell reaction. So that's why you'll see somebody that's had chronic tendinosis, tendinitis, whatever it is, they're going to have a thicker tendon on that side. See it all the time with Achilles. It's because you constantly are laying down more layers, but you always have that kind of those pieces, those different fibers in the middle. So if we can knock out one of those fibers in the middle, it's always at a loss of capacity. So that's how we're increasing capacity is actually stacking more tendon on top of that. It's a little bit different than how we heal a muscle. So back over to the goals. What's the goal of our energy return phase? When we talk about running, jumping, uh, Olympic lifting, anything like that, it's elastic properties. So a tendon is supposed to be able to stretch and let go. Well, if I lose that elastic property because I have a loss of capacity, I a, have to build the capacity, then I have to build that property back through proper training. This is where we get into plyometrics and how to load the eccentric to allow the concentric to explode. This is also, which hopefully becomes before return to play or the big go down here, where we actually, in, in my clinic, we're looking at biomechanics way up here because that's how we're going to reduce sensitivity as, long, as well as this is we want to reduce sensitivity through changing biomechanics. We could also get into the debate of that has to be specific or not. Could we just change how they move randomly and we reduce sensitivity? I'm going to lean on pretty heavy. We want to improve biomechanics towards improving biomechanics, making them better for their goal, their task, their sport. So that's where it gets into motor learning and skill acquisition. As we're going through the isometric, isotonic, and energy return phase, hopefully we're working on biomechanics and in essence installing new software. So by the time we get to the skill acquisition return to play, we have a different movement, which overall is going to reduce sensitivity and not hopefully lead us back down this gauntlet. We did mention in the last video, there is rarely an acute tendon injury without a uh, unhealthy tendon, AKA unhealthy tissue to begin with. So we got to talk about nutrition when we're talking about healing stuff, but hopefully we're in the preventative mindset. We're doing, uh, looking at biomechanics, doing some of this in our training, especially depending on what part of the season we're in, what sport we play, we got to look at nutrition. So vitamin C can also is also called pro collagen. So collagen makes up every tissue in your body. If we want the ability to stack more of these tendon fibrils on top of one another, we better hope that we have enough vitamin C in play. There's been research done that we should have vitamin C and gelatin. I'll put in the notes here exactly how much uh, prior to sport activity or working out in particular when we're going through rehab. Now I put collagen in parentheses. There's a lot of hype about collagen. You can go into any, really any grocery store now, not even a health food store, and find all sorts of collagen creamers and collagen protein and all this stuff. There's not a lot of research that props up uh, collagen by itself. Gelatin, uh, whether it has more research behind it or it just tends to work better, maybe unknown. And then protein. You always have to make sure that you have adequate amount of protein in your diet because we do take those proteins down into their base amino acids and then that's part of the building blocks for tissue as well. So we covered in the last video how to differentiate what part of the umbrella of tendinopathy you fall under. Now we're talking about the strategies of how do I get around this thing from a rehab standpoint? And we have all sorts of videos on our YouTube channel of different exercises that you could implore or inject these different strategies into. We're gonna have one more video coming out around this vein, talking specifically about knees and how to determine, well, is it a tendinopathy? Is it a patellofemoral pain? Is it IT band syndrome? Is it a meniscus tear? And trying to do our best at home, especially in a time like now where we're uh, living under quarantine, of how do we determine on our own up to a certain point what's going on. Hope you guys learned something. See you next time.